Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Channel 781 News special report. As you know, in the past year, there's been a lot of talk in Waltham about our schools and how they're doing. We've done our best to cover that on Channel 781, but it can be difficult to find people to talk to how, who have real insight into what's going on. So I'm very grateful to have a guest here today who can help us with some real insight. I am here with former Waltham High School principal, Brenda Pina. Hi, everyone. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, so Brenda was principal of Waltham High School for the past year, the last school year. Um, she was selected in a process where the public got to weigh in on video interviews. Uh, before that, she was in the school as an assistant principal, and before that, as an adjustment counselor. She's also a graduate of Waltham High School. Um, so how are you doing? I'm doing well, I'm doing well, thank you for asking. And you have a new job, right? I do, I do. So I am a, a K to 12 district administrator for the Chelsea Public Schools. Um, I am overseeing their social work department. That's great, congratulations, and that's going well? Yes, it's going very well, thank you. <laughs> that's great to hear. Um, so I sort of tried to summarize a little bit. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about your time, your career at, Waltham High and what you're most proud of from your career. Yeah, so um, as you had stated, I'm a former graduate, a graduate of 98, um, always a proud hawk. Um, and my career started, I really started in social work um, and started actually in the Chelsea community back in 2002. Um, so it's nice to kind of go back where it all started. Um, and got into um, education um, in 2006 and was in Waltham from 2006 till 2014. Um, left, um, helped, worked with, closely with Christopher Gelinas um, with the class of 2014, uh, then left to, for a short period of time, I was a founding member um, at the Bentley Academy Charting, Charter School in Salem um, and did, I was a Dean, head of family engagement there um, for a good number of years and then back in 2017, then the opportunity came up. There was an interim associate principal position open um, at the high school. Um, it was something that I was always interested in pursuing leadership and continuing to pursue the leadership role. Um, so I applied for that position um, and got the position and was there until recently, uh, until this past year um, when I resigned as principal of Waltham High School. Great. And so what, looking back on that whole time, what are you most proud of? I would say, you know, I see myself as a trailblazer. And I think, I think what I'm most proud of is being the first Latinx administrator in the community, uh, but also the first female principal um, at the high school. It's something that uh, I'm very proud of, um, although it was a short amount of time um, within the high school as a principal, I did serve four years as an associate principal um, and former to that was um, an adjustment counselor. So I've had a long standing, I, my time has been long in Waltham. Um, so I would say definitely proud of what I've accomplished. Um, you know, as someone who is a member of the BIPOC community, um, I think for, you know, um, for the Latinx community, I think it was, it was a big win. Um, to be able to even have the opportunity, um, you know, and I'm thankful for Dr. Regan for giving me the opportunity to be able to experience uh, that leadership role and for trusting me in that role. Um, so I would say that's something that I'm very proud of um, and will continue to be proud of. Great, great. And so now that we've gotten started on a positive note, what were the biggest challenge? What do you think was the biggest challenge you faced? Oh, I would say post post pandemic, um, you know, the uptick in uh, student behaviors was a challenge. I mean, it was a nationwide issue. Um, it wasn't specific to Waltham High by any means, um, but I would say definitely the the increase in the mental health needs of students. Um, you know, really the there was you know dysregulation and how do we you know I think we went in with this mindset and I think this is right. This was kind of the fault of leadership and really just the Department of Ed, we kind of just went in with this mindset that students were just going to go back and reintegrate and they were going to pick up right where they left off. Um, and that was something that, you know, 
I think as, as a whole leadership team, I would say as a district, I would say really, you know, under the guidance of the Department of Ed, it's something that I think now looking back, I think we recognize, I think also Desi recognizes it as this was an area that was a missed opportunity. Um, you know, it, and I don't know if there's any real answer in terms of what's the right way to reintegrate students into the school. Um, I, but I do think that we expected students to just come in and follow structure and follow routines, um, not really taking into consideration that the past two years, there was disruption, um, right? Our current freshman, last year's freshman class, their last normal school year was sixth grade. And I think, you know, not really recognizing that. So of course there's dysregulation. Of course they're, you know, they're, they're not responding well to structure. They've just spent two years at home with, you know, um, I think parents did the best that they could, but, you know, families had to sustain their families financially and people went to work, kids were home alone um, without any supports, without any real resources, without any real structure um, other than jumping on a Zoom or a Google Meet to be able to attend their classes. Um, so I would say that was probably the biggest challenge. Um, I think supporting students um, with the increase of mental health needs. Um, I would say also, you know, supporting staff, right? I think we forget that, you know, we have to humanize ourselves and we forget that staff, right? They're also humans. They also have personal lives. They also have families. So I think those were really missed opportunities. And I think I did the best that I could to try to provide that support to the best of my ability, right? And for, we had a whole team that was providing that support. But I think really just recognizing that people did not come back really in the right place. Um, they weren't feeling, they weren't feeling great. They, you know, they, there was all these personal struggles. Um, the pandemic really put a dent in, in education. Um, and I think, you know, even still today, I think we're still, I mean, kids, I feel like are better this year. And that's the pattern that I'm hearing from, you know, current teachers in Waltham, um, even in Chelsea, we're seeing it where I think students are feeling better and are coming in more motivated um, and feeling grounded, but there's still some lingering, um, I would say, so, so kind of it, the impact was huge. And I don't think we really took that into consideration um, as we prepared for their return. Can you say more about what you mean by dysregulation? Um, so I would say in terms of just their own ability, right? Their coping skills, problem solving skills, ability to really manage behaviors, um, their own emotions. And I think that's where the dysregulation was happening was, you know, they weren't connecting well with adults in the building. Um, you know, and they were really struggling with their kind of managing their mental health. Um, and I think it was so, um, I think a lot of it was beyond us, right? I think we have an amazing support team at the high school that was able to do that work um, with our school adjustment counselors, with our guidance team um, that were doing that amazing work to support students, right? Our nursing staff who worked tirelessly with COVID and tracking and really supporting students but I think what made it really difficult was that there was no additional supports beyond the scope of the school day. Um, you know, met the waiting list were endless for any type of therapeutic supports. So, you know, it was just, I think there was a lot of system, systemic breakdowns, I would say, um, beyond the educational environment. So being able to access those resources were difficult, um, you know, and, and just the waiting list. I mean, we're talking months, we're talking, you know, people that just couldn't get serviced or seen. Um, so I would say those were probably the biggest challenges when it comes to a student that was either dysregulated or not feeling emotionally connected. Um, you know, in addition to, to those struggles, right, we were dealing with, at that moment, we were dealing with Black Lives Matter. We were dealing with, you know, just the racial tensions within our society. Um, and, you know, there was just a number of things, right? School shootings, things were happening that really were creating a, an, 
really an environment of, I mean, there was fear. There was fear sometimes going into the building, right? Fear from myself, fear from staff, fear from students um, in terms of what is today going to bring. Thanks. Yes. And that's that's really consistent with what we've heard from everyone we've talked to who is involved in schools, that the last academic year was maybe the most difficult ever, not just in Waltham, but around the state and around the mm -hmm. country. Um, were there other challenges you were dealing with that were more specific to Waltham? You know, I would say, I think, you know, for me personally, I think some of the challenges, my own personal challenges was, you know, being, being a Latinx leader. Um, you know, this is something that is, was very new to the community, uh, being a female leader, um, you know, and I think those were some challenges. I recognize that I didn't fit the mold. Um, I recognize that from the beginning, I called it out from the beginning. Um, you know, I didn't fit that typical profile of that, you know, vision that they had for a high school principal. Um, you know, there was also times where I was doubted um, in my role and, you know, doubted as a leader, you know, the, the mentality that school counselors don't make good leaders, good building, building leaders, it does exist. And, and I've heard that time and time again. Um, I would say this day and age, we absolutely make really great leaders because there's certain skill sets that I bring to the table that other people might not have. And I think, right, and we're all valuable stakeholders, but I think I, I would say that was probably one of the biggest challenges that I had to face as a leader was being, you know, questioned time and time again in terms of, Am I qualified to do this position? Am I qualified to be in this role? Am I qualified to support students? Am I qualified to support the building-based staff? Um, you know, and I would say that was really, you know, I would say more the community challenges when it comes to, to that and, and the politics, right, of the city. Um, you know, I would say overall, when I came on as principal, there was a lot of support in the community. I think there was a lot of excitement. Um, Right. But there's always that loud minority that, you know, seems to have a lot of influence in the city um, and and can make it challenging. And I think those were some of the barriers that I faced where, you know, it was like the minute you felt like you were, you know, you were kind of moving forward. There was something else to kind of push you right back to where you started. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, and all eyes are always on the high school, regardless. Uh, right. Right. Beyond you know, beyond central office, the next, you know, where eyes are next is always the high school principal. Doesn't matter what district you go in, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, so I would say, you know, for me, it was really challenging. Like I never felt like I belonged, even though I grew up in the city, I graduated in 98, will always identify myself as a hawk, right, as a proud hawk, but I still felt very disconnected. Um, and at times I felt tokenized, um, and those are things that were real to me, um, you know, and, and difficult. Um, I would say, I think what was really challenging was we knew that we needed certain resources. Um, but again, right, we know there was budgeting implications and there was struggles, um, with the district budget and, you know, um, but it, it was hard. It was hard to to make requests and feel like you weren't getting what you needed. Um, you know, and those, for example, things that I had asked for, you know, we had asked for things for many, many years for like security staff to help with monitoring car the corridors, monitoring the hallways, making sure students were in class, you know. Um, and I, I was able to get, you know, we had asked for four, I got one. Um, we have almost, you know, there's close to 1,700 students in that school, um, you know, and a lot of moving you asked for Just to clarify, you asked for four people who would just be in charge of making sure yeah. people were staying yeah, on Yeah, just campus. making sure people staying on campus. And, you know, we had to, you know, and we did the best we could with the support team that we had and the administrators. But, you know, um, a lot of my time, right, as, as a building principal, you want to get into classrooms, you want to see all the great stuff that's happening, because we have amazing educators in that building that are doing great work. Um, but then I'm outside on the golf cart trying to make sure that the building is safe. And, you know, I'm doing rounds in the golf cart with the SROs. And, you know, so we, we were trying to really 
we were stretched really thin. Um, you know, and not saying it's anyone's fault. We get that there's budget restrictions and it is what it is. Um, but those were challenges that we continued to face, you know, and we were getting criticized for, you know, the behavior at the high school's out of control. Well, yeah, it is out of control. You know, I said it at our first school committee meeting that I presented at. I didn't sugarcoat it, but I said, yeah, these are the challenges. But the, this is why we're dealing with these challenges, right? Whether it's lack of resources, dysregulated students, you know, um, we had to, you know, yes, we can recognize the behaviors, but when we're not being solution oriented and not having conversations at the table in terms of, you know, what action steps we can take, then, you know, it's a vicious cycle. You're just going over and over again and you're pointing fingers, but nobody's really being solution oriented. And I think, right, as, as a building leader, those were things that I struggled with. Um, you know, there's always, you know, all these initiatives that have to take place and that are happening, right? There's other responsibilities that I have as a building principal beyond the scope of safety and well being. Um, and it became, you know, safety and well being became my top priority. And that's where probably 80% of my time was going where not only was I a building principal, but as times I was functioning as an AP as well, because I was filling in and supporting students and um, meeting with families and doing things to try to help, um, you know, the rest of the, the AP team and the administrative team within the building. Um, so I would say, you know, those are things that I think are just challenges, right? The operational challenges and then you know, the overall challenges of things that you see you need in your building, but you don't always get, right? We have a wish list. We don't always get it. Um, you know, I prepare budget presentations and I'll ask for certain things. Um, my budget presentation this past year was really focused on student safety and well being, um, you know, extra cameras, you know, security staff, um, really trying to, to, to make the building as safe as possible. Um, you know, I ended up getting one security person, um, but that was that was a stretch. Like we really had to, <laughs> we we had to plea for it and and, and beg for it. Um, you know, we had a meet, we had a safety meeting with the mayor, and she was very responsive to us. And we had shared a safety plan that we had created a safety um, kind of a a plan that we had put in place probably like five years ago. And we said, we've been asking for these things for five years, Mayor, here it is. So we handed it to her um, and she was responsive and, you know, she pushed, you know, for cameras. And so this past summer before I left, they were starting to add extra cameras. They were starting to secure doors and do things, but it only took us four to five years to ask for those things. Um, you know, I'm glad it's being done now, uh, but those are things that we had to push for. Um, you know, it's an older building, kids will figure it out, right? We have, and reality is, you know, they prop doors and they do things and we remind them, but we also have students who have to go out to the auto program behind and still have to exit. So it's not really ever a hundred percent safe because kids are exiting and entering because they have to. Um, so my hope is with the new high school, you know, that there'll be some other security measures. I think it will be more, you know, I do think it will be more secure, um, you know, and again, those are just things that challenges that we've just had to face with the structure of an old building. You mentioned the um, budget process and you mentioned, you know, being criticized over the school safety issues that you already knew very well were an issue. Um, it makes me think of uh, in this year's budget process when the school budget came to the city council, there was a session where the councilors basically grilled the superintendent for over an hour um, on some of the problems you mentioned and some other problems in the school. I remember thinking at the beginning, while this could be, you know, if I worked at the school and I felt like the superintendent wasn't doing enough about these problems, this could be really vindicating to watch, you know. But as it went on, I thought, wow, this could be really demoralizing too, because it's a lot of talk about problems without, like you said, it was a lot of bringing up problems without um, suggesting a solution. And in the end, they approved the mayor's budget that 
was a lot lower than what some people in the system were hoping for. So can you talk a little bit more about when we're talking about the schools in the community, what's helpful and what's not? What are the problems we should talk about and what are the problems that are getting blown out of proportion? What should people in the community to be talking about when we talk about the schools that's supportive? So I would say in terms of, you know, the schools and the support that's needed, I think if for me, right, we, we have to really kind of, so it's hard to say that there's issues going on within the building if you're not there, right? You're not in the trenches day in and day out. So there's a lot of misinformation that is shared within the community. And those are things that, you know, we've always, and I've always invited folks into the high school to do tours, to walk around, to be able to do those things. Um, but I think for me, I would say those are the misinformation, the, mis, the, the assumptions, the misperceptions. And if you want to really, if you really want to know what's going on, then come to the high school, right? Come and do a walkthrough, right? Whether it's school committee, whether it's city councilors um, to be able to do that. So I would say really, you know, and I think you also have to talk to not only, right? Not only to the leaders because we have our own perceptions on what we think is happening, but also connecting with teachers, connecting with students, you know, um, those are the folks that are, are really directly impacted within the building. Um, and I do think it was happening in pockets, but it was very selective on who they were engaging in conversations with. Um, and I would have loved to have them in the building to find out really what's going on, um, but not really to, to criticize, really to be, right? You really care about this community? Then let's come to the table. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk about what are the real issues and how we as a community can band together and work together to improve systems. And I think that was really, for me, I think was really the challenge. And I think after this, this meeting, um, it was really, for me, I think it's really where kind of things just shifted for me in terms of where I was, you know, it was, I felt like I was at a loss. Like I was like, no matter what we do, it's never gonna be good enough. And, and that was my own personal struggle. And so because, that you're talking about that that meeting with the council. That correct. Was, yes. Correct. That was a that turning was a turn. point for me, um, and it was, and it was a hard reality, um, right? Because not only am I invested in the school, um, I was in it for the, the long haul. Like that was something that I really made very clear when I when I got the position, that I was in it for long term. I wasn't going to go anywhere, and I felt strongly about that. I, I love the community. I love the students. I loved the staff that I was working with. Um, but that was really a turning point where I said in, I was like, there's no matter what we do, I don't see systems improving if this is the mindset that we're dealing with. If, is if, if this is the mindset of members in the community who holds leadership positions within the community, if this is how they're if this is how they're feeling about, you know, whether it's any school leadership, specifically the high school is the one that really took the brunt of it all. Um, you know, it, it was it was hard. It was a really hard hit for me. Um, you know, and and I tried to refrain from engaging or watching things that were that could be damaging. Um, but it's hard not to, right? It's hard not to see things on social media or it's hard not to engage in those conversations. Um, you know, I, I did speak to a couple of the city councilors and, you know, and trying to really kind of just connect with them. Um, but it, it, was, it was not easy. And again, I don't know how receptive they were going to be to me, a female Latina in a leadership role. I don't know how receptive they were gonna be to me. And to be honest, not sure they really wanted to hear from me. So I think that sense of belonging, that sense of feeling respected and valued as a leader within the community is something that I think I initially felt in the beginning, but then it kind of just faded away. Um, and that was, I think that was probably the turning point for me where I had to make some difficult decisions for myself, for my own mental health, 
for, for my family. Um, you know, I have two beautiful girls, um, really just saying what's in the best interest of me and my family, um, because it was becoming to the point where it was, it was emotionally damaging. And just to be clear, I, I appreciate this. And just to be clear, you know, in the beginning, we were talking about how last year was hard, largely because of student behavior issues. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is the turning point for you was not that. It was the, oh, no. the community and the way that adults in the community um, perceived you and treated you. Yeah. And again, it's not everybody, right? I think Waltham has a great community. I think they have a strong community. And again, very small, loud minority. Mm -hmm. The students were not the reason um, for me making those decisions. I absolutely adore and, and love those students. And I actually just contacted one of the teachers yesterday and, and, I, and, I, and I asked her, I said, please let the students know that I'm thinking of them today as they walk out of the school. I said, let them know that I am with them, you know, in spirit and my heart is there with them. I would have loved to be there with them and I would have walked beside them. And I think that for me, I think that was probably the most, the hardest. Um, for me, it was painful because I felt like I was walking away from, I, I felt like I disappointed staff. I disappointed students with my decision. Um, and that took, it took, you know, it, it took a lot out of me to be able to make this decision, right? It was very painful. There was a lot of tears, right? Because I was emotionally invested, um, but the students, the, the behaviors, the behaviors weren't the issue. Yeah, you have to deal with them and it be, sometimes it can become challenging, but that's the work that we do, right? We're there to support students. Um, I can deal with all the behaviors. That was the least of my worries. It was, it was really the, the city politics and, you know, that, that challenging, you know, perception of, you know, she's not good enough. She can't do this job. And I think that was, you know, and yeah, you know, I, I have thick skin and I could have stuck it out. Um, but I also believe in working in a district that when they say they're working for equity, that they really believe that they're doing that work. And what does that work look like? Um, and that they're taking action steps to continue to support the equity work. Equity work is long-term, but when you, when it becomes a vicious cycle and you're not seeing much progress, and yes, there's been gains in the city, don't get me wrong, but I felt stuck. I felt stuck as a leader who strongly believes in equity work. Um, and, and I wanted to be in a community where I felt like I belonged, where I was heard, where I feel respected. Um, you know, and where I feel valued as, as a professional, because I'm not someone that's just coming in to do the job, but has no experience. And I think that was where, you know, some of the comments that were being made, whether it was the Waltham channel or whatever it is, um, were painful to read because they were really questioning my qualifications or my professionalism or my ability to do the job, um, you know, and I've, I've prepared myself well for years to do this job um, and I can do it well. And I connected with students, you know, and there was nothing more that brought me joy when students came into my office because I had students in my office all the time. The principal's office wasn't the office you would go to because you were in trouble. I had students eating lunch in there. I had students just sitting in there with me having conversations. And when students are telling me that this is the first time, I had one student that stood out to me when she walked into my room and she said, she says, I've been in this office many times. She goes, I can tell you that this is the first time that I feel safe walking in here. And that to me is huge. That's why I was there. I was there for the students. I was there, that was the real, that was my motivation. And that's what got me to wake up every morning to go there and to, to deal with another day and to kind of fight through another day. Um, so it does, you know, it does make me sad if that's what they, you know, if they feel that I left because of them or if that's the rumor. 
that's definitely not and I hope that we can kind of clear Just that to be up. clear, I have not heard of that as the okay, rumor. Good. What I did see is there's a, a, a forum on Reddit called uh, Unpopular Opinion, and there was a very popular, unpopular opinion that said the teacher shortage is not because of uh, pay, although that's part of it, it's because of terrible student behavior. <laughs> So I thought I should ask in case that's going around. I don't have any reason to think that's going around Waltham. And I wanted to say, actually, you know, I think a lot of people in town were very disappointed to hear you were stepping down. But I think even those of us who knew practically nothing about the situation figured you probably made the right decision for yourself and your family. You don't seem like someone who gives up easily. So I, I just wanted to say that on behalf of all the people in town who'd like to say that to you. Um, Thank you. Congratulations on making the right decision for yourself. Thank and you. Your yeah. And to that, you know, to that unpopular comment, you know, yes, student behavior is definitely difficult, but that's not, I don't think that's one of the reasons. I mean, for some people it might be, but I would say, you know, what I, in conversation with a lot of educators in the state, what I am hearing and what people are feeling is lack of support and lack of resources. And I think that's really what it comes down to. It doesn't come down to, yes, student behavior is what it is, but we're educators. That's what we're in the business for, right? You, whether it's, we, we follow restorative practice, right? Not only I, I believe in restorative approach, right? So there's some non-negotiables. You got to sometimes, right? Kids need to be accountable and discipline comes with that. Um, but along with that is a restorative approach to supporting students and educating them, right? It's discipline alone and suspension alone doesn't deter behavior. And I think being able to offer them, you know, yes, you got to deal with this and we got to, you know, and when we see you back in two days, this is what you're getting when you come back. Um, but I would say it's really lack of resources and support and, you know, and cutting programs and funding and, and things that are just happening statewide and nationwide that educators are taking a hit. And not only that is you got to compensate your educators, right? And, you know, that's, that's another issue, right? We're talking about kind of you know, the, the 0.75 and some of the, the struggles with negotiations within the city. It's people want to be compensated for the work that they're doing. And it is a slap in the face, you know, when, when you're offered something that is below, far below what is expected. And I think that is, how do you expect, how do you expect to attract people to a profession? If, if it's one of the lowest paying professions and if, you know, and if people aren't being supported, it's like, it's not attractive. And I think that's really, you know, those are really the challenges, right? We know, you know, student behavior will always exist. And you know what? The pegging of the doors at the high school isn't a new issue. It happened 20 years ago, you know? So they made it a new issue and they wanted to believe it was a new issue, but it's not a new issue. And I think that's what I think was frustrating for me where I was like, these issues have always existed. Why is it becoming, you know, a Brenda Pena issue now? Because why? Because you don't like who's in the seat. And, and that's what it really, I think a lot of it came down to. Let me ask you about another thing that's come up that you have a lot of insight into, um, which is there's been discussion in years for Waltham about the support we provide for English learner students. Um, this year it came up in that city council hearing um, that we were talking about, and there seem to be a lot of different opinions about what we can or should be doing. For example, the mayor said that she thought the ideal model would be a separate high school for English learners within the same building as the regular school. So you are someone who graduated from Waltham High as an English learner student, went on to have a very impressive career, also has an educational background in social work. So you have a lot of different point of views to look at this from what should we be doing for English English learner students? So, you know, that's interesting. So, I mean, a few, many, many years ago, right, there was the Newcomers Academy, which was part of um, the high school, um, but it was, you know, it, it, and I don't want to say it functioned as a school within a school, but there was a program. Um, I believe in inclusion, 
And I think all students should be included. Um, you know, I struggle with the thought of separating those students, right? Because one is that segregating, and I'm not sure that's really, if we want students to understand or be part of the educational school system, if we want students to, you know, have opportunity, right? When we talk about equity, equity is opportunity and giving students what they need when they need it. And, um, and that looks different for everyone. But in terms of a completely separate environment, is something that I don't think is is the solution. I think there has to be you have to really look at the program as a whole and see what services are needed to to help um, you know improve student progress. Um, you know, look at the curriculum, see what's you know. I also am a product of bilingual education, right? So for me, bilingual education. I know that's not the way they do things now, but I can tell you everybody I graduated with from Waltham that was part of that bilingual education is very successful right now. And I believe in that model. Um, you know, not every student that comes in, I mean, you know, being inclusive, but also putting them in an environment where they're not able to speak their native language or get resources and materials in their native language. It, that's a difficult thing. You know, students should be able to go into the classroom and if they need, you know, they, it, my, my biggest concern with ESL learners, right? They, they come from very different backgrounds, but a lot of them have educational gaps. So now you're embedding a student, right? You're putting a student into a class where they may have never, never have ever seen the material. So how do you prepare them? How do you accelerate to kind of get them to where they need to be? Um, you know, so for me, you know, I think just the inclusion is necessary. Um, but again, how you scaffold, how you prepare material, how you present it, um, that's, those are things that can happen within a classroom, right? And it will take a little extra, um, because it is going to take a little extra, right? It might take us a half an hour to do something with a particular group of students. With our ESL students, it could take us an hour, an hour and a half, but you have to take that time. Um, but I do think, you know, in terms of the programming, um, I don't know if this is the direction they're heading in and if they're thinking of a separate school. Um, I would love to see them to continue to be included within the high school environment, but being able to really look at the programming that's being offered for those students um, and really looking at solutions to try to accelerate their learning um, and support them, right? And meet them where they're at because not every student, they all have different learning needs and not every student that is going into a particular class is at the same level. Many of these students have gaps in their education. So being able to support them is something that, you know, it's, it's, it's very complicated um, and it's not, there's, I don't know if there's any real easy solution other than just making sure that you have the programs um, that are accessible to them to help them be able to accelerate. Sure, thank you. So you said um, some of the bilingual education students you went to school with are very successful now. That makes me wanna ask about another idea with that sort of came up in that hearing, which is that a lot of immigrant students do not have an expectation to graduate high school. And so when you look at the high dropout rate of English learner students, um, you can't, uh, you, that, that isn't a good measure of the school because they're not expecting to graduate. Can you respond to that at all? I guess my, my, my question to them would be is, have they heard directly from those students that they're not expecting to graduate or is it an assumption? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, right, that's where sometimes biases come, um, into play and, um, because there is an assumption that these students don't want to graduate. And yeah, I'm sure that's from, you know, that could be for a handful of kids, but you know what, that could also be for a handful of kids that aren't ESL learners. Mm -hmm. um, so to make, you know, to kind of come up with that as a conclusion, I think is really an unfair statement 
um, because kids don't know, students don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And it is our job and our responsibility to help support and educate those students, right? And to give them the exposure, um, whether it's with, you know, I worked with uh, Waltham Partnership for Youth and they were doing the welcoming class um, that was facilitated by um, the academic case manager at the high school, Josue Teo, who's phenomenal. Um, I'm not sure if he's still there, but he's wonderful. Um, but being able to support students with really kind of teaching them the ins and outs of the US educational system and what is, right, and what does that entail? And how do you, you know, and, and I think what's really challenging is, I think what becomes more challenging is we do have young ESL learners that come in at the age of 14, 15, and great, they can, you know, they can be successful and progress. We do have some older learners that I think need the alternative, right? And that's where that Waltham Opportunity Institute um, would have been a great program, but wasn't funded properly. And that is for the overaged, undercredited youth, right? And that was something that was spearheaded by, you know, a, another um, former colleague of mine who, you know, I absolutely appreciate and respect, Mary Jo Rendon, um, who's now the associate principal for the senior class. But when things are underfunded, there's not much you can do, right? And now you're reallocating resources taken from the high school to reallocate for this program. It just doesn't work. You're not giving these students what they need to be able to excel. Um, so for me, I think it's, I think it's a false statement to say that this is not, you know, and again, it could be for a handful of kids, sure. But I'm sure that also is for the general ed population that, you know, we also have a handful of kids that their expectation is they don't really want to graduate. And that's, you know, but how do you support those students and how do you, you know, you don't just stop servicing them. Um, and I think that's, I think that's the challenge. And if that's the mindset, then that's really unfortunate um, because I've, you know, I believe, I believe in those, I was one of them. I believe in those students. Um, and if you, you know, if you treat them as if they don't know anything and well, that's what they're gonna do. We're gonna just kind of go with it because they're never gonna learn anything. If that's the mentality, then yes, of course, dropout rates are going to continue. Kids aren't going to feel like they belong or they connect. Um, so I would say, you know, my hope is that they'd figure out a different way to support them um, and, you know, be creative with what they're offering in terms of their resources. Thank you. Um, so earlier this year, uh, way back in February, I went with the other organizers of Waltham Pride to a school committee meeting so we could talk about, <laughs> we could respond to the attempt to ban books. Um, Chris managed to meet you there, and that turned out to be a really good connection because we invited you to speak at Pride, and it was great because it was exactly what we hoped. It seemed like a lot of young people were there largely to see you, and we're really happy to see you in that context context. Um, can you, oh, and I also wanted to say that was an important connection because now we have this interview. So thank you, Chris, for that too. <laughs> but can you tell us more about working with uh, the LGBTQ plus students at the high school? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, so when I present, when I spoke at Pride, you know, um, it was an honor to be able to speak, but that was really the first time I had shared my story. Um, I had never, you know, I, I was, I was vulnerable and um, I felt that it was important for me to share. One is because I knew there was a number of students there and there was incoming freshmen that I wanted um, to see me and to, to, to see that, you know, that they weren't alone and that they had the support. Um, you know, in terms of my work within the building, you know, I always provide students with a safe space to be able to connect. Um, we have our, you know, our GSA that was very active, that's still very active, um, and two amazing advisors that are also facilitating that work. Um, you know, my, I, I guess I would have, I would have loved to be more directly involved with the LGBTQ community. And I think that's something, you know, when the opportunity came up to be able to speak, I didn't hesitate. Um, because I knew that was 
that was such a good in and such a good opportunity to really just be in the community and have people see me for who I am and to see what I represent. Um, you know, but I would say in terms of my work at the high school, I would have loved to do more. And I feel like personally, I feel like I didn't do enough. Um, and I'm, you know, and I'm okay with saying that because I think it's accountability is important. And, um, but, you know, if I could do things all over again, I think I would have invested more time um, with our LGBTQ plus students. That's great, but I, I, I can't speak for them, but I, I have a feeling if they were here, they would say thank you so much for what you've already done. It was, it's already a big deal when you look back at the fact that it hasn't always been something that could even be discussed, so. Yeah, it was thank definitely, you. it was, uh, I was a little nervous, um, you know, doing the speech and, and um, but then, you know, just the response afterwards was amazing you know, the number of kids and I got some emails, which were really great. And, you know, parents and um, caregivers, you know, saying, you know, my, my student is an incoming freshman. And they were like, that's my principal. Like they, you know, she, they just said the excitement um, of knowing that they could feel like they could connect with someone um, and that someone, you know, could, you know, could share a similar story. Um, and I think that's what really stood out for me was, and I think what was really important and I think impacted the community as a whole, I think, right, when we think of supporting students, students want to see a reflection of them. And I was that reflection. Not only was I, you know, um, a member of the LGBTQ plus community, but I was also a Latinx leader. Um, I was not the typical AP honor student, right? I was that student who was, you know, got reading and math support. I was that student that was an ESL learner. And I think for, for students to see and say, if she did it, so can I. And I think that is what I think will, will always stay with me is the fact that I was able to, to demonstrate that for our students to say, you know, I grew up in the Waltham projects. That doesn't mean all is lost. Like you can, you can do great things and never let anyone tell you any different. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question. So you said there was a vocal minority in Waltham who made you feel unwelcome. I don't want to ask you to name names, but I thought maybe, can you tell us some who some of the good guys were? Who were some people in the school community and the Waltham community who did support you and did make you feel welcome? Yeah, I mean, I would I would definitely say um, I had the opportunity of really work, working closely with um, our PTO and, and our families. And um, I would say, you know, um, the, the PTO that I worked with at the high school, um, great, great individuals. Um, I think they made me feel really welcomed and supported. Um, you know, Jonathan Foss and I had a very good relationship. Um, he was one of, you know, um, you know, we stay, we still stay in touch and he was a huge, you know, um, advocate for me and um, wrote me a really great letter when um, I was going for the principal position. Um, you know, there was some other community leaders, um, you know, that I connected well with as well. Um, some religious leaders that, you know, were really connected to me as well. Um, you know, Lucas, who's no longer at the library, um, who is phenomenal. And he, you know, part of the youth center, um, also a big support of mine. And, um, you know, so I would say, you know, there was definitely, you know, the mayor and I had a really good rapport as well. And, um, you know, um, school committee members, John Frasica, you know, and I had a really good, we have a really good rapport as well. And so there was definitely some members, you know, within the community that I think, you know, were supportive um, and, you know, took the time to really have conversations um, and to listen and, you know, and, to, and we learned from each other. Um, which I really appreciated, um, you know, and yeah, there was those other, you know, the, the small vocal minority that, you know, were loud and obnoxious and, um, you know, and I'm sure they still are, right? Whether I'm there or not, they're still doing their thing. Um, but I would say, you know, I would say overall, I had some really good support and my team, you know, I had a phenomenal um, team at the high school um, that I missed dearly. And 
Um, you know, some of them have kind of moved on, you know, um, Ryan Gendron is now the principal of Wilmington High School and he is phenomenal, um, you know, but Darrell Braggs is now the current principal at the high school and, um, you know, Dr. Lyons and Mary Jo Rendon and, you know, the resource officers, Kristen Tracy, John Farrago, um, you know, Jackie Hughes, just really great people that I had the opportunity um, to really work with. Um, and, and I feel blessed and fortunate that I had that experience and that opportunity. And um, it was hard. It was hard for me to, to leave Waltham. Um, it's a community that I love and I still love, you know, despite, you know, some of the, you know, the feelings towards me. Um, I still love the community and I would be there for the community. Um, you know, someone asked me a question and said, what if they called you and asked you to go back? <laughs> which I said, that's not going to happen, but they, <laughs> depends how hard they beg, right? Yeah. It's like the hypothetical, right? Someone asked me that. And I said, you know what? I said, I haven't really, I said, I haven't really thought of it. I said, but I said, I'd be torn, um, you know, because I, I had my reasons on why I left, um, you know, and, but I love the community and it's near and dear to my heart. I feel connected. Um, that's where my roots, right? Those, my roots are there. Um, so for me, it's, it's a hard, it was a big loss, right? I don't know if people felt that I was a big loss, but I felt like it was a big loss for me. Um, and it's still heavy, you know, it's still very heavy. Um, at times I get emotional when I think about it or I talk about it. Um, but it does, it still feels heavy. Thanks. Well, so just to, you know, that actually leads into my sort of wrap up question, which really touches on the whole of everything we've talked about is the idea of support and that educators need support from the community. Mm -hmm. And that's not optional. It's a it's a make or break kind of thing. And it seems to me there are certain city departments where people almost unconditionally support them will come out and uh, if they're in danger of getting a a budget cut will stand up for them and will stand up for them almost all the time. So I would like to see Waltham become that community for the schools and show that kind of support for the school. So my la that's my last question. What are the most important things people in the community can be doing, both parents and non-parents, to show support for educators? I think when you don't support educators, that's when you really lose good staff, right? And I think that's Unfortunately, that's happening nationwide. I think there is, I, I can't remember in the beginning of the year, it's here in September, I think they were saying something like, I don't know, there was over 6,000 jobs that were still available in the state via school spring, right? Um, in terms of educators. Um, and I think in terms of the support is really just family engagement is important. And I think, right, it's, it's kind of, it's, it takes the educators to, to connect with families, but it also takes families to kind of under, to take time to understand the, the daily struggles and challenges within a school system, right? And I think, I think that just happens by conversation, right? And opportunity for conversation. I'm not sure there's enough conversations taken place. There's a lot of assumptions. There's a lot of thoughts and ideas of what might be happening. But I don't think there's any forums or any real conversations taken place to say like, you know, for educators to express some of the challenges and for families to express some of their concerns and challenges as well. Um, and I do think there needs to be a forum and an opportunity for people to really just come to the table, right? Whether it's a community conversation, but being able to say like, right, this is where we're at. These are our struggles. These are our challenges. We want to work together collectively because we care about your kids in our schools to be able to, and we want to do this work. Nobody's shying away from the work. I think people are invested. People are committed, right? There's a lot of veteran staff that have stayed in Waltham because they're committed and they're invested in the community. Um, but I think there's not enough, there's not enough conversations taking place. And, and that's what I would encourage is more conversations. Um, you know, someone, I think, you know, um, Dr. Rendon um, and Soledad Valenciano, they host um, something called the, and I don't know if they still do it, but it's um, 
Saturday groups that they do um, with our Latinx families. And um, those, those charlas are extremely, extremely valuable because even though it's a small group that gets together, it's very consistent. And they're able to have those conversations. Um, there's opportunity to educate families and parents on what is going on. And I think more opportunities such as that is critical um, and is necessary. Um, you know, it's a large district. How do you do that? You know, it's hard, but we've had community conversations before. Um, and, you know, I invite not only families, but school city councilors, school committee to be present and to partake um, and to really hear from parents in terms of and answering their questions. I believe in transparency. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes you have to be transparent and yeah, it, it sometimes it's painful to, to share, you know, all the things that are going wrong, but you also can't sugarcoat it, right? Um, people observe it, people see it. So you have to have those conversations. Um, so I'm a big, you know, I'm a big fan of, you know, um, family engagement. I think it's necessary. I know the district also believes in family engagement. It's something that we try to push, um, you know, from, you know, su the, the superintendent's office and, and beyond. Um, but I would say really opening up more opportunities for those conversations to take place. That's great. So frank and direct conversations. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't get, you know, if you don't, if you don't kind of call out the issues, they're never going to get resolved. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not personal. Right. And that's one thing someone told me during the library challenge. They said to me, you know, so, uh, someone had called me an unfit principal and you know, and someone said to me, you know, how did you stand there? Like you just, they said you were so poised and you just stood there. I was right next to the individual. And I said, I said, that's only their opinion. I said, you know, I'm confident in the work that I'm doing. I don't need to be acknowledged by someone who, you know, doesn't know the work or doesn't understand the work or isn't taking the time to learn it. So for me, it's, you know, sometimes you have to have those, I don't take it personal because people don't know what they don't know. And if they don't take the time to learn it or to educate themselves, then, right, that's, that's a them issue. But, but I also think as a school community, you offer opportunities to engage in those conversations um, and whether they're difficult or not, right? Um, I don't have all the answers and I never pretended to. And that's why you have a team. That's why parent feedback is critical, right? Caregiver feedback is critical. That's why, you know, I invited all that feedback because it's important to hear. It's what helps develop me. It's what helps push me to, to improve as a leader. Um, you know, and that's my hope that other people would be able to do the same. That's great. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so glad you're doing well. I'm so glad you're appreciated you. in Chelsea, but I have a feeling the story of you as a leader in the Waltham community is not over, <laughs> that there will be another chapter at some point, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, thank you for doing this interview. We're at Channel 7 a one We're going to look for ways that we can interact more directly with um, students at the school to find out what's going on there to try to fix some of the communication gap you've talked about. And I really appreciate you talking to about us about this. It's just been a lot of insight on a really important issue. Thank you. And I appreciate you inviting me in it. It's been great. Thanks a lot. And thank you everyone for watching. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>